Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's update on COVID-19 in Alberta. With us today is the Minister of Health, Tyler Shandro, and Dr. Dina Hinshaw, Chief Medical Officer of Health for the province. Minister Shandro will provide an announcement, followed by remarks from Dr. Hinshaw. Thank you very much, Tom. And thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's been a tough year, a uh, tough year for all of the Albertans who have been touched by the COVID pandemic. And most of all, for those who in our province have lost loved ones. And it's been hard for all of those who have been working on the front lines of the pandemic. In our hospitals, continuing care facilities, families, doctors' offices, and community clinics. And I think we all could use a little bit of good news right now. We've all watched the excitement in the United Kingdom as people there have gotten their first shots. Especially William Shakespeare, of course. And I know that people have one question. When will we be starting here in Alberta? 
So I'm very pleased to announce that the answer is next week and we're planning specifically to begin on Wednesday, December 16th. With Health Canada's approval of the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for use in this country, we are activating our plans to begin vaccinating the first group of healthcare workers. To protect those caring for our most vulnerable, the first 3,900 doses will go to ICU doctors and nurses, respiratory therapists, and long-term care workers throughout the province. These staff are exhausted and they've put themselves at risk for 10 months. They need support and they need to know we're there for them. And I hope that seeing the immunizations begin will show them that there's light at the end of the tunnel. For them, for their patients, and most of all, for all of us throughout the province. And as we learn about how to manage and handle the vaccine, Pfizer is requiring that we begin by administering their vaccine only at the site of delivery at this time. So we can deliver it to continuing care facilities in this first round in December, but we hope that by covering the staff, we'll start reducing the risk to patients and residents and will immediately reduce the burden and risk for the staff. The first acute care staff will come from Foothills, and Peter Lougheed Center in Calgary, and from the U of A and Royal Alex Hospitals here in Edmonton. We have the facilities and equipment in place to meet the ultra cold storage requirement for these first ch uh, shipments at two locations in Alberta, one in Edmonton, one in Calgary. This Pfizer vaccine will require, as you've heard before, two doses, approximately one month apart for the vaccine to be effective. Alberta Health Services will be booking the second dose appointments when they administer the first dose. Over the coming days, AHS will be reaching out directly to those who are eligible for this early distribution of the vaccine. The first shots will be given next Wednesday, as I said. And we're still working closely with the federal government to confirm the next shipment of vaccines, but expect it will ar arrive later in December. We'll share more details as soon as the timing of that shipment is confirmed. Alberta is ready to deliver this vaccine. We're ready to deliver it safely, appropriately, and without delay, thanks to the detailed planning of my ministry's public health team and AHS with the support of Task Force Leader General Paul Winnick. This early distribution is an important step in our continued fight against COVID. But we cannot take our foot off the gas with our adherence to the public health measures and the restrictions in place. It will be many months until the majority of Albertans are immunized. And until then, we are each other's best defense. Still today is welcome news though, welcome good news for us all. I'll now invite Dr. Hinshaw to come to the podium for today's update. Thank you, Minister Chandra, and good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin today by reminding Albertans that it is important to seek medical care when you need it. During this pandemic, we are all trying to do the right thing, maintaining physical distancing, wearing masks, saying no to social gatherings. As announced yesterday, we are at a critical point in this pandemic. Now more than ever, we need to be careful and cautious in our daily activities. For some people, this means working from home. For all of us, it means no social gatherings with anyone outside our household or two people for those who live alone. For some, this has also meant choosing to delay a doctor's visit out of fear or anxiety. But that is not what we mean when we talk about being careful. Please do not avoid going to the doctor if you need to. This can lead to serious problems if health concerns go unchecked. COVID-19 has put a lot of things on hold, but your health should not be one of them. During this pandemic, it has become clear that Albertans are not seeking medical attention as often as they normally would or should. This trend is not unique to Alberta. It has been identified across Canada and many other countries but we need to change that. 
the health system in Alberta remains a safe place to go if you need help. It is open and ready to help diagnose and manage illnesses and diseases. Alberta Health Services and the Alberta Cancer Foundation are reminding Albertans about the importance of listening to their bodies and seeking medical attention if they notice any changes. This pandemic is spreading a new illness, not stopping existing ones. Please talk with your health care provider so they can investigate any new persistent symptoms if you are experiencing them. This includes things like an unusual or growing lump, significant blood in your stool, urine or phlegm, or growth or darkening of a mole. These can all be signs of serious health issues, including cancer. It is important that we catch these things early. An early cancer diagnosis can offer more effective treatment options, has better survival rates and provides better quality of life after a diagnosis. However, diagnosing cancer early is a complex process. It requires a person to notice a change in their body that is persistent or worsening and then requires them to seek medical attention. Often, multiple interactions between patients and different healthcare providers are needed to arrive at a diagnosis. Sometimes this happens quickly, but it can also take time. The sooner this process starts, the better off that person is. That's why it is important to continue to have health conversations with your primary healthcare provider, pandemic or not. If you notice any changes that concern you, book an appointment with your family doctor or nurse practitioner. If you do not have a family doctor, you can find one by calling 811 or HealthLink or by visiting albertafindadoctor.ca. Turning to today's cases, over the last 24 hours, we have identified 1,640 new cases of COVID-19 in Alberta and completed about 16,800 new tests. This means our positivity rate is still high at about 8.9%. There are 685 people in hospital, including 121 who have been admitted to the ICU. Looking to schools, there are currently active alerts or outbreaks in 430 schools, or about 18% of all schools in the province. As a reminder, junior and senior high students are now learning at home, so while we are attributing cases to these 430 schools, only 200 93 of these are still open with students. Currently, all of these schools together have a combined total of 1,726 cases. This number includes 109 schools on the watch list. Sadly, there have now been 653 deaths related to COVID-19. My thoughts and sympathies are with all the family, friends and communities grieving the loss of someone they loved. Today, I also want to provide some additional information on surgeries from Alberta Health Services. As I mentioned yesterday, COVID-19 is impacting our health system and AHS is putting additional surge measures in place in the Edmonton zone. These additional measures, as I mentioned, include postponing as much as 60% of non-urgent scheduled surgeries that require a hospital stay. Within these constraints, the government and Alberta Health Services are still working to ensure as many Albertans as possible continue to receive needed surgeries in the coming days. As I mentioned yesterday, AHS will continue to support Albertans who require emergent or urgent surgeries. This includes surgeries resulting from major or minor trauma, urgent cancer, cardiac or vascular surgery cases. AHS is also working to continue to perform as many surgeries as possible across the province. Depending on the number of Albertans with COVID-19 who are hospitalized in different zones and sites, surgeries will continue to the maximum extent safely possible. To make sure that as many of these surgeries as possible can continue, we all need to work together to reduce our cases so the pressure on the healthcare system is reduced. The vaccine delivery announced earlier by Minister Shandro is exciting news. It is remarkable that we will have a vaccine available in the same year that this pandemic arrived in Canada. However, as I've said before, while the arrival of a vaccine is positive news, it will be some time before we can immunize most Albertans. 
Until then, we must be the vaccine for each other. Finally, I know that there are many questions about the new measures announced yesterday, and we are working hard to address them. Please continue to visit the Alberta.ca COVID site for updated information and guidance. I have heard some confusion specifically around outdoor gatherings and would like to help clarify. As of yesterday, outdoor social gatherings with anyone outside your household are prohibited. This includes getting together in a park or around a bonfire. We have not changed people's ability to participate in outdoor sports and recreation in groups of up to 10 people. This reflects the ability of people to do these activities while keeping distanced and wanting to keep options open for physical fitness in outdoor settings. However, I am also asking Albertans to please follow the spirit of the restrictions that are now in place. This is about reducing the spread, not finding loopholes. Please don't go skating or skiing with groups of friends if you can go with your household instead. Stick to your household. If you are unsure about what to do, please err on the side of caution and make the safest choice. Remember, the goal is to bend the curve, not the rules. This is a challenging virus. While COVID-19 cases can accelerate very fast, they decelerate more slowly. The long incubation period means that hospitalizations and ICU admissions will likely continue to rise in the coming weeks. In other words, the path down the peak is much slower than the way up. I know it's been a hard year and many of us are tired, but we need determination and resolve now more than ever. These next few weeks will determine how we enter 2021, with cases soaring or with them starting to level off or even decline. So please be careful, let's be kind to each other and embrace the collective responsibility that we all share. Let's stop the spread of COVID and do everything we can to enhance the spread of compassion. Thank you and we'll be happy to take questions. All right, we'll go to the phone now. Please direct your question to Dr. Hinshaw or the Minister of Health. Operator, could you put through the first caller, please? First is Kevin Nimick with CTV. Go ahead, Kevin. Hi there, this is a question for Dr. Hinshaw, but uh, Minister Chandru may also want to weigh in. It's a question about enforcement. If someone were to lie about a positive COVID-19 case while visiting a family member at a hospital or care home, what do you think would constitute appropriate enforcement in that matter? It's clear that uh, someone who is actively infected, infectious with COVID-19, or even someone who has symptoms compatible with COVID-19, who is not remaining at home, uh, that that individual is violating the legal order that requires them to stay home and away from others, except for the purposes, uh, for example, of going for testing. Uh, and so those individuals, if they, if they do uh, knowingly violate that, and particularly if they enter a very vulnerable setting, such as acute care or a long-term care home, uh, those individuals could be uh, faced with penalties such as uh, a fine uh, or other penalties that would be applicable in that situation. Uh, but I think the important thing to remember is that it's not just about the enforcement, it's about the reason why. And so I would really appeal to people uh, who may be feeling a little symptomatic and thinking, well, it's not a big deal and I really want to go in to visit my loved one and, and visiting uh, people that we love is an important part of supporting them, uh, that you could be putting not just their lives at risk, but the lives of others around them at risk. And this is not a time to be taking these things lightly. So I would encourage all Albertans uh, to be very, very mindful of the decisions they're making and the consequences of those decisions. Minister, did you want? Okay. Operator, could you put through the next caller, please? Next is James Keller with the Globe and Mail. Go ahead, James. Hi there. This is a, thanks. This is a question for both uh, Dr. Hinshaw and Minister Chandra. We're hearing that hospitals in Calgary and Edmonton, particularly Edmonton, are still operating beyond their capacity, in some cases considerably. What's your understanding of the current situation? Uh, what facilities is this most acute? And can you put into context what it actually means on the ground when a hospital is operating above their stated capacity? 
The uh, situation, as I understand it, and Alberta Health Services would be able to provide more specific details, uh, but the situation, as I understand it, in Edmonton in particular, is that uh, they're operating at above capacity with respect to the number of spaces that are available for treating patients, also taking into account some of the healthcare worker shortages that are being experienced. And so what it means to have that uh, demand that's exceeding the, the capacity is that additional spaces that aren't typically opened are needing to be used for caring for patients. I know that Alberta Health Services has been working very, very hard over the past uh, many months to make sure that the plans for expanding capacity put patient safety at the forefront. Uh, but I also know that the more admissions we see, and again, today we, uh, we've seen a significant rise in our hospitalizations and ICU admissions, that the more we see that rise, the more it puts pressure on other parts of the system. Uh, and so again, I think the implications are needing to reduce things like scheduled surgeries and not uh, doing procedures that mean that others could potentially require a hospital bed. So in order to care for those patients, who are needing ICU care or hospital care, other patients waiting for services need to have those services delayed. And that's really that key implication. Uh, Minister, did you want to comment on that? Thanks, James. Uh, yes, it's um, so functional capacity uh, for any hospital or for any zone is calculated through a number of factors, and one of them is bed occupancy, which I think you were talking about. But it's uh, as also as as Dr. Hinshaw pointed out, also a number of other factors contribute to trying to figure that out, and one of them is the workforce capacity. And as we do have um, healthcare workers who've had to self-isolate or had to stay at home for um, taking care of someone who might be self-isolating, um, that's also something that gets considered. And so the, the functional capacity, um, I think, for um, in Edmonton, um, in, in this, you might probably have to go and, and double check with AHS and with Covenant, but I, I think it's the Misericordia and the Great Nuns that are um, seeing the, the highest um, strain right now in, in their, their hospitals and their facilities. Um, and look, this is uh, incredibly difficult for our frontline workers, for those who are in our ICUs, those who are working in the, the surgical units and the medical units. Um, it's, uh, it's been incredibly hard for them. And um, we also have to remember that um, anytime there are new public health measures, cases um, will continue um, to not see differences for, for another two weeks after that. And another two weeks even after our cases uh, might come down from uh, public health measures that uh, might be imposed, um, we will continue to possibly see uh, continued increases in, um, in hospitalizations as well. So we, uh, our, our folks are stressed, in, in especially in Edmonton right now, and we thank them all the folks who are working in those ICUs and in those medical and, and surgical units for the stress that they're, they're under right now. All right, we'll go to the operator. Could you put through the next question, please? Next is Julia Wong, Global News. Go ahead, Julia. Hi, first a clarification question for the minister, um, and then my question after that will be probably for the minister and Dr. Hinshaw. So is the plan to give a first dose to 3,900 healthcare workers or just a half that amount, which would be 1,950? And also, what metrics will be used to determine if or when the restrictions announced yesterday are lifted, and what are the thresholds for those metrics? Uh, thanks, Julia. So you're right, because at one point, I think the federal government was requiring a holdback of half of the doses that be received and, and being held for that second dose for the same people. Um, I understand that the, uh, the conversations that the federal government has had with, uh, with Pfizer allow us with the certainty to, to give out those uh, 3,900 doses to 3,900 healthcare workers and not holding back that uh, half of that at this time. So um, that, that, thank you for allowing us to clarify that. So the, and the second question again, Julia, was about, um, about the, the measures and maybe I'll just let you rephrase if you don't mind. Sure. Um, what metrics will be looked at to determine if or when restrictions are lifted and what are the thresholds for those metrics? 
Well, I think Premier has, has said this, um, not with um, when, what we announced yesterday, but um, two weeks ago um, in November when we Im imposed further um, public health measures that we wanted to see our cases coming down. We wanted to be able to see the R rate coming down below one. Um, so that is going to be one of the metrics that we're looking at. Um, I'll, I'll um, ask Dr. Henshaw to clarify um, what other um, metrics that um, she and uh, her team in her office and the other public health folks in NHS will be uh, looking at when they um, come forward uh, with uh, recommendations to us. Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> and uh, with respect to the metrics, so the, the R value for the province, uh, and we calculate that once a week, the R value for the province um, as of the end of last week was 1.13, so still above 1. And we are looking to bend that down below 1. Again, that would indicate that we are shrinking the number of cases. And in addition to that, we do need to bring down the number of new daily cases that we're seeing every day because even uh, a relatively low R, if we're still seeing a high number of new daily cases, can be a, a concerning combination. So we're uh, working to put together a combination of, of different metrics with very clear triggers uh, and that uh, that uh, choice about which triggers to use, again, there's no one metric that's going to be perfect, so we are going to have to look at the pros and cons of those, and a final decision hasn't been made with respect to uh, the exact, you know, th that suite of measures and those specific triggers. Uh, but what we do know is that we need to bring our, our new daily cases down. Uh, that will require a decrease in our R, and it will require, again, that we're seeing that continuous lowering day over day of our number of, of new active cases. A small point of clarification, the net increase in new cases today is 1,460. We have time for three more questions. Operator, could you put through the next one? Next is Rafi Bujakanian with CVC. Go ahead, Rafi. Thank you. I just want to revisit the answers you provided, James Keller, a couple of minutes ago. So he was asking about how poorly the hospital system is doing at the moment. And I guess in light of what you both said, Minister and Dr. Hinshaw, about uh, some of the hospitals in Edmonton being overwhelmed, are we now at a point where you would expect to have to use these field hospitals that we've been talking about? Or do you still expect that they're just a measure of, you know, precaution that we hopefully won't need? Uh, thanks, Rafi. First of all, you are totally and completely wrong. Um, our hospitals are not performing poorly. Um, I got to correct that. Um, and and our AHS Covenant, um, our nurses and our doctors, yes, they're under stress, um, but um, they are performing admirably. They are doing amazing work. We are ensuring um, not only are those those Albertans who need critical care getting it, but AHS. Had, and our surgeons throughout the province are um, really focused on making sure that unlike other provinces, we are reducing um, surgeries in, in the most minimal ways here in Alberta. We caught up in 90, over 90 percent of our surgical backlog from the spring, unlike any other province. Um, they've continued to try to, to keep our surgical capacity um, at uh, pre-COVID levels. Uh, now that hasn't happened um, right now in the fall in, in Edmonton, but um, I think um, the hard and amazing work that AHS, our frontline workers, our surgeons are doing, our ICU staff are doing is, is amazing. Um, so just wanted to clarify that. Uh, but you, you also asked about whether at this time um, there would be a need for a field hospital. No. But first of all, we we'd never had a field hospital planned. Um, I just want to highlight again, I've answered this question before, um, AHS was in discussions about a field tent and we already have a field tent. It's, there's already one. Um, it's, it's located at the Peter Lougheed that was uh, installed in the spring. Um, now they're, they're, HS has looked at whether uh, further tents would have to be procured and whether they need to be secured at this time for contingency plans. Um, there's um, no, um, at this time, 
doesn't seem to be a need for a further field tent to be erected. Um, but uh, uh, no, there, there is no plans for a field hospital or field tent at this time. Operator, could you put through our second last question, please? I'm Alicia Corbella with Post Media. Go ahead, Alicia. Oh, hi, I'm Minister Shandro. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have any more numbers about how many more vaccine doses we can expect by, before the end of the year? And also um, by the end of March. And so presumably, yeah. if we're, expe we're expecting clearly another 3,900 uh, doses uh, within that 21 days, Span between the first and second shot for these people. A am I correct to presume that? Uh, you, you are correct to, to presume that uh, for, for the last part of your question. Um, look, we haven't been given firm numbers or firm timelines by the, uh, the federal government. Um, the, um, the purchase agreements are, are with the federal government and, and the manufacturers. Um, I understand that they've given estimates, I think it was around a quarter million to, uh, to Canada uh, in total by the end of the calendar year. Um, how many um, will, will, of, of those will be sent to Alberta and, and when? We, we don't know at this time. Um, so we continue to wait for, for the federal government to give us those details. What, what we're um, able to be in control of and, and what we're, we're prepared for is how to accept them. And we um, have done the, uh, I guess the, the dry run has begun, um, how to store them, how to distribute and how to provide them. And, and so that's what we're in control of and, and we're ready to deliver uh, if and when we get any further vaccines. Operator, could you put through the final question, please? Final question is Lauren Poland with Global Calgary. Go ahead, Lauren. Hi there. My message, uh, my question rather, is for both um, the minister and for Dr. Hinshaw. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the, the hospital rates that uh, we have been seeing here. We have received some projections uh, from AHS, the um, early modeling system, the early warning data that shows on the high end we could see more thousand people in hospital, plus nearly 200 in ICU by December 24th. Infectious disease experts that we talk to say it does look like uh, from the modeling that they have seen and the case numbers we have seen that we could reach medium to high projections. Can you outline your level of concern with those numbers and uh, what impact it will have for hospitals? And is that the barometer for possibly those field tents to need to be used or what kinds of changes could we see by that December 24th date if we do reach those projection numbers? Yeah, so again, this isn't modeling. Uh, I, I've answered this question from the NDP many times. This isn't modeling. This is the predictive analytics that AHS has used throughout the pandemic and they, they use a number of assumptions and epidemiological um, data to be able to figure out what they can uh, estimate from a case count, um, what the, the increase of stress in our hospital system might be from a one to 14 day period. Um, and it's been fantastic work. It's allowed us to be able to respond so effectively throughout the pandemic. So thank you to them for this early warning system that they've developed. Um, you're, you're right, we are concerned with these uh, increased numbers and we will continue to see increased cases. I, I think unfortunately it does take time for public health measures to, to show an effect in our case counts and even after case counts start to go down we will still continue even for two weeks after that to see increases in our hospitalizations. That, that is to be expected. Uh, we are ready, AHS is ready and they continue to be prepared to make sure that everybody who needs critical care will get that care. There may be times when there may be um, surgical procedures which are postponed as a result, um, as we've started to see in Edmonton, that, that would be the result. Um, and no, we at this time, even with these projections, do not anticipate a field tent to be used in AHS operations. Uh, further to the one that's already been installed at the Peter Lahey, I should say. Thank you all for joining us. Dr. Hinshaw will provide another update tomorrow afternoon. Have a safe night. Mr.